Behold, an invitation to wonder by Justin Hoffman. Chapter 7 A Foundation or a Stumbling Stone. Narrated by the Tuesday Night Core Group Girls. Chapter 7 A Foundation or a Stumbling Stone. God's love is the most awesome thing about Him. Sinclair Ferguson. Everybody loves love. The virtues of love have been extolled from time immemorial and love is still recognised today by people the world over as one of the last objectively virtuous virtues. Plato, some 300 years before Christ, paid this tribute to love. Love is the joy of the good, the wonder of the wise, the amazement of the gods. In love with love. Love was a theme of bards in the Middle Ages, was embraced by the romantics of the 18th century and is still extolled by countless cultures today. Love is the subject of urban graffiti, the slogan of smooth-talking politicians and the theme of copious lyricists. Love is the key, contends one songwriter. Another famously observes, love is a many splendid thing. But perhaps the most well-known contemporary homage to love was contributed by John Lennon in 1967. At the height of the Vietnam War, the BBC commissioned the Beatles to write a song for our world, the first ever live international satellite television production. The BBC requested that the song contain a simple message that would be understood by viewers of all nationalities. All you need is love was the result. When the broadcast aired on live television, the Beatles were joined on stage by the Rolling Stones, among others, for this special occasion. The message of the song was true to its prescription, if a little redundant. All you need is love. Da 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 da. All you need is love. Da 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 da. All you need is love. Love. Love is all you need. When we consider the timeless attraction of love to the masses, however we are made to ponder exactly what is meant when the Bible insists God is love. Is scripture merely jumping on the bandwagon of love or is it saying something entirely countercultural, no matter what the current culture may be? Paul makes a startling claim in his letter to the Christians in Rome. He pictures Jesus Christ as the pivot point of all of history and all of humanity. How we relate to Christ determines how we relate to God. God is love, we learn, but love is not God. Love cannot take the place of Christ and still be pleasing to God. Paul writes in Romans chapter 9, verse 33, As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Behold, Jesus Christ is the great cornerstone of history and either we are building our life on him or we are stumbling over him by taking offence at him. According to Paul and other writers, as we will see in both the Old and New Testaments, love is not the key to life. Jesus is. Love is not all we need. Jesus is. God's love, we learn, is the most awesome thing about him and it has everything to do with Jesus. God is the one laying this stone. Notice in Romans 9.33 that Paul begins his claim about Jesus with, as it is written. This idea of the Messiah being the great cornerstone of history did not originate with Paul. Paul is actually quoting the prophet Isaiah, who lived over 700 years before Paul. God has been speaking of the Messiah in this way for centuries. God is the one laying this stone. And though the Messiah is a stone of stumbling to some, God sends the Messiah out of mercy. Because you have said, we have, now, uh, we have made a covenant with death, for we have met, made lies our refuge, and in falsehood we have taken shelter. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, of a sure foundation, Isaiah 28, 
verses 15 to 16. It is God's mercy that leads him to lay his foundation stone. God looks at people who are ultimately in love with death because they are putting the hope in illusions. They are making lies their refuge rather than running to God. They are trusting every empty thing imaginable as their shelter. God sees people who are running away from him and he chases after them. He proclaims to them a sure foundation instead of the quicksand of their own solutions. Those who build their lives on this foundation will live forever instead of perishing for certain. Or as Paul puts it later when he quotes Isaiah, they will never be put to shame. Whether it is Isaiah prophesying of the Messiah to come or Paul looking back at Jesus as the Christ, we are meant to see that Jesus is either your sanctuary, your refuge, your foundation of whom eternal life is built, or else Jesus is a stone of stumbling over whom you trip on your self-destructive way to eternal death. Jesus is God's watershed revelation to the world, God's own righteous character and God's only way of salvation for self-destructive sinners are wrapped up and perfectly reflected in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Whether you and I recognise and honour and believe in Jesus or not, God has set him as an immovable foundation stone of salvation or of judgment. The psalmist would write of this Messiah. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvellous in our eyes. Psalms 118 verses 22 to 23. This is the Lord's doing. Jesus is the Saviour God himself has sent. God is the one who has laid this foundation stone. To some, Jesus is a stone of stumbling. One might think that when God himself sends the solution for humanity's total salvation in the perfect person of Jesus, no less, all the world would celebrate and receive him with open arms. But no, the covenant we have made with death is a strong one, entered into willingly because we would rather die eternally than rely on God forever. When people come face to face with perfection himself, they react in one of two ways. They are either irresistibly attracted to Jesus and put their faith in him, or they are repelled by the unrelenting glory of God they see in him. What makes the difference? What makes one fall down, break open her life savings and pour it on Jesus' feet of out of gratitude, while one of his closest disciples is betraying him to make a little extra money? Sure, on a surface level, we might guess that the woman feels helped by Jesus and the disciple feels somehow disappointed by Jesus. But surface explanations don't suffice. There are too many contrasts, too many people either hailing Jesus as their greatest hope or treating him like their greatest threat. The Apostle Peter gives us a deeper look at what is going on. Interestingly, Peter quotes from the same passage in Isaiah that Paul alluded to as well. And Peter makes the sure to surprise claim that people are responding differently to Jesus in every age because they are beforehand set apart for salvation or not. Peter explains that those who believe on Jesus do so because they are among those chosen people through whom God has purposed to bring joyful praise to himself while those who stumble at the word do so because they are dead set on disobeying God's word, destined to stumble then at Jesus. For it stands in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honour is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. 1 Peter 2, verses 6 to 9. Peter is here describing the widely varying responses to Jesus 
and while placing the responsibility for unbelief squarely on the shoulders of those who reject Jesus, Peter plainly insists that those who honour Jesus do so not because of some innate wisdom or superior insight on their part, but because they are set apart by God. Faith in Jesus, it turns out, is the sovereign and uninfluenced work of God in the hearts of his people. Before we unpack this teaching further, we should probably mention that Paul is making the identical point back in Romans. Before quoting Isaiah in Romans 9.33, Paul provides examples from biblical history of people who either responded to God in obedience or in rebellion. Paul brings up the twin brothers Jacob and Esu, who are brought up by the same parents, even born at the same time, yet their destinies could not be more disparate. Paul speaks of Pharaoh, who steadily rejects God's word, even as Moses is God's meek servant, though they are both brought up in the royal household. What makes the difference? Paul concludes it must not depend on birth or rank or any other human factor. It depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Romans 9.16 The difference maker is God's mercy. Those who stumble over Jesus do so because of their own poor choices. Yet those who build on Jesus as the foundation of their lives do so not because of their own goodness, but because of God's mercy to intervene in their hearts and lives. God's mercy is not according to national affiliation or according to blood relation. God's election is not based on human efforts or connections, but according to his own purpose to have mercy. Or to use Peter's language, it is by God's choice. And yet it is also by our choice in a sense as well. Because all of this says something about the depth of our own heart's self-deception. Why would anyone reject perfection when they saw it in the person of Jesus himself? Why would any of us make a covenant with death in the first place, choosing to walk away from God rather than follow his healthful and holy ways? There is a pre-existing condition, a deadness of heart, our sinful nature, that predisposes us towards self-destruction rather than towards God's freely offered salvation. The fact is, as Paul and Peter both plainly unpack in their letters, death is the result of our own plan, while mercy is the result of God's. This is why the psalmist would describe damnation in the shocking terms of God actually allowing people to get their own way. I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels, Psalm 81, 12. Sin results in separation from God. But here we are also reminded that it means being joined completely to our own desires and schemes. At first glance, this might not sound so bad, the thought of being married to our own desires and plans doesn't seem to be much of a penalty. In fact, isn't that more like what we call a dream come true? But in reality, this is judgment. This is punishment. Those who persist in sin and rebellion, God leaves to their own stubborn pursuits and allows them to walk in their own counsels. The person who is left to her own counsel finds that she is like a blind person at the street corner without a guide. She is free to walk any direction she pleases, but there is danger and destruction on every side. As C.S. Lewis explains, there are two kinds of people in the end, those who say to the Father, thy will be done, or those to whom the Father says, thy will be done. The great punishment for sin is getting our own way. The fact then that God does not have mercy on everyone is not what should surprise us most. It is the fact that God has mercy on anyone. Mercy is not a birthright. It is an undeserved benevolence. It is God intervening in our own self-destructive, hell-bent path and turning our hearts back to himself. Whoever believes in Jesus will not be put to shame. What is your response to Jesus? Just stop for a moment and ponder, because this is the question that Paul's statement, if we really behold it at all, presses us to consider. There are only two kinds of people in the world, either those who stumble at the idea of God's perfect saviour, Jesus, or those who put trust in him and will therefore never ultimately be put to shame. 
What is your response to Jesus? Do you stumble over him as an obstacle to the way you want to do things? Or are you building your whole life on Jesus as your cornerstone? Clearly, it is my desire as I write this book that you will be among those who, by God's mercy, believe in Jesus. And this was Paul's desire as well for those around him. It is noteworthy that in the context of Romans 9, where we find some of the New Testament's strongest teaching on the sovereignty of God in salvation, Paul, in this very context, expresses his passion to see others saved. The language with which he opens the chapter could hardly be stronger. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Romans 9 verses 1 to 3. It is difficult to imagine a more emphatic lead in that than Paul's here. I am speaking the truth. No, really, I am not lying. My conscience is clear before God. Paul wants us to know that what follows is not a flighty passion or a flippant exaggeration. And what is it Paul is taking such great pains to communicate? I am grieving with constant anguish in my heart. About what? I long to see my own kin, the Jewish people, come to know Christ. In fact, I would take their curse myself, cut off from Christ, if I could see them be saved. Paul has just shared one of the most glorious promises of eternal security in all of Scripture. Nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 39. Then in the very next breath, Paul expresses his great sorrow that his own people do not have this secure salvation. He actually expresses he would be willing to be damned himself if it would mean the salvation of his kindred. This is such a strong statement, we dare not carelessly take it on our lips. Paul certainly doesn't. And it is so powerful, we could probably spend the rest of this book just considering that one statement further. What is perhaps just as arresting, however, is that this is not the only such strong statement in the Bible. Moses had expressed the same intense love and interest for his people in his day. After pleading with God to forgive them sins, Moses offered to take their place if need be. But now, if you will, forgive their sin. But if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. Exodus 32 verse 32. Clearly, for both Paul and Moses, embracing God's sovereignty and salvation fed, rather than hindered, their desires for the salvation of those around them. It did not lead them to fatalism, but to fervency. In this, they are following the footsteps of Jesus himself. Jesus would declare his gratitude that his father, the Lord of heaven, had hidden truth from the wise of this world while revealing it to the childlike. Then Jesus would die for them both. Jesus both reveled in his father's sovereign judgment and longed to see people saved. It is because of his Christ-like heart that Paul speaks then in Romans 9, 33, of Jesus as a stumbling stone for many people. And then in the very next verse expresses his prayer for these people. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Romans 10, 1. How should we apply Paul's balance in our own Christian walk? If we want to have Paul's eternal perspective in daily life, we must embrace the full spectrum of Paul's theology. The preacher of sovereign grace also pleads for God to save sinners. Indeed, surely it was because Paul believed in God's sovereign power to save sinners that Paul was passionately engaged in prayer to God for the salvation of others. What greater motivation to prayer could there be in knowing that God actually has the power and authority to answer those prayers? It brings great joy and freedom as we, like Paul, yearn deeply and pray constantly for the salvation of others. What good would it be to pray for my children's health or grades if I could not pray for the one thing in all the universe that I know matters most, the salvation of their souls? What a sorrow it would be if I could not talk to God about the souls of my loved ones 
when God himself tells me in his word that the eternal things are the important things. Yet, even as I pray for the princess of the world and my princess in her bunk bed, I must pray, as always, not my will, but yours be done. As with every other prayer, I must be willing to trust the goodness and wisdom of God to do what is right and best. He is, after all, the God of goodness and mercy. I bring my greatest requests, my heart's deepest desires, and I lay them at his feet. And in Jesus' name, I trust that God will hear and do according to his good pleasure.